Should we start with Netflix? I think there's an image with Netflix, which is here's a company with very, very deep pockets, and they're going to make their money by getting creative people, giving them freedom, giving them money, letting them make what they want. And, you know, that worked incredibly well for them. Lots and lots of people went to work at Netflix. They produced some amazing work along the way. But the top three this week, I think, tells a story about where Netflix is going next. And by the way, not necessarily a worse place, just I think an interesting place. Okay. So Hit me up on the top three of last week. So number one is The Gentleman. I've got a huge number of views, none of them positive. About The Gentleman? Oh, yeah. Really? A horror show. Move your neck, be a chicken! I'm a fucking chicken! Oh, you think? He has nothing to say, Guy Ritchie, about absolutely anything, and I thought it was appalling. Well, he's got stuff to say about what would happen if you had a cannabis farm at your stately home. God. People well, love it, but you can't trust people, can you, Ritchie? People, well, you know, listen, that's where you and I differ. Yeah. <laughs> because, because I do and you don't. I mean, if you look at many of the worst parts of the 20th century, I think you can't trust people is a perfectly reasonable assumption. Oh, I thought you were about to blame Guy Ritchie for all the worst parts of the 20th century. Uh, if he could go back in a time machine, I'm sure yeah. he would only, make them worse. Only the later bit of the 20th century. Now, it's hard to overestimate what a huge hit that is for Netflix. Massive. It's been number one for four weeks, and stuff on Netflix doesn't stay no. number one for four weeks. Absolutely. It's like two or three days, and then... We move on. It's been absolutely huge, huge in the UK, huge worldwide. Um, it's obviously got a brand behind it, Guy Ritchie. It's very broad. Let no one say it's the work of one of the great auteurs of our time. It's very, very broad. And its appeal is very, very broad. It's, it, it's for a programme with, you know, lots it's of... It's like a cartoon. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very mainstream yeah. for what the mainstream is these days. At number three in the Netflix charts is The Three Body Problem which is this huge show by the makers of Game of Thrones based on a Chinese novel. And Netflix has spent a lot of money. This is absolutely classic old school. This is what we think Netflix do, is they make these big sort of showpiece series that, you know, are complicated, interesting, difficult, don't necessarily have to have big stars in them. It should have ticked a lot of boxes because it has got that global feel. So what they really want is people in all territories. Yes. Subscribers in all territories to be watching this. And it does certainly cover a lot of territory. It does. But the interesting thing is it's not doing that well. For the money they spent on it, being number three... It's also not very good. <laughs> well, again. Sorry, another one, but honestly, wow. I, I can't... Once I hear people saying science is broken, this is even worse than when Denise Richards played a nuclear physicist in The World Was Not Enough. But, yeah, science is broken. Is, the, yeah, but it, is that not the trailer line? It actually is broken, be? though, Yeah, if you think about it. So, three-body problem, 200 million. Great, and it's, you know, whatever one thinks about I it. I think that's the most expensive thing they've ever made. Yeah. I think it's 20 million an yeah. episode and that is a lot for them. And it is not really conquering the world. It's doing perfectly no. well. Lots of publicity. We're talking about it. Lots of people talking about it. But, it, you know, it's not top of the charts. Number two, number two in the Netflix charts is Cleaning Up. Do you know Cleaning Up? No. Exactly. So Cleaning Up is a six-year-old ITV drama starring Sheridan Smith. Uh, about a cleaner at a office in the city, and you know, oh, yeah. is uh, and very good by the way, produced by Jane Featherstone, who only does brilliant work. It would have cost Netflix forty grand to buy it. You know, ITV already made it; it already appeared on ITV. You know, uh, had its run. People, a few people watched it, but you know, it was well reviewed. But then disappears. Now Netflix buy it, and it's the second biggest show in the country. It is a bigger show than Three Body Problem. That's extraordinary. So much of their stuff now is going to be people licensing their old content. Normally, though, they want there to be a lot of it. Yes. Um, they want there to be a certain amount of seasons of it because people really want volume on Netflix. Well, that's what happened. So in America, the, the Suits phenomenon, that you know, they yeah. started showing Suits and it became the biggest. Well, Sex and the City is about to come. It's been licensed to them and they're now going to show it again. They've got more publicity just for doing that. The amount of sort of think pieces of people saying, oh, will this new generation be ready for this show? Will they find it, you know, its attitudes dated or will they be shocked by it? Or all of these things, that, you know, all those things when you get news stories about TV shows, as in that is completely free publicity it, it functions as a very kind of sticky form of advertising and yep. that people see those and read them and so it's amazing that you can sort of rather as suits did suddenly start a sort of almost nearly dominate the cultural conversation with a not very good show i'm talking about suits in my in my view <laughs> okay. that you think everyone had already seen because yep. it was old 
But that's the fascinating thing. And, you know, all creatives and writers and directors like to imagine that they are sort of in the vanguard of culture and, you know, they're the sort of people everyone's waiting on. And the truth is, Netflix, and you write from the beginning, 15% of, you know, Netflix US's viewing was the American office. 15%. Uh, it is a terrific show. It is. A, see, that is a terrific show. Finally, show. we found one. Yeah. No, there's lots like. of good shows. Yeah. I just thought the ones we talk about. But this idea of them not having... They have got plenty of money. Yeah. In fact, you know, they, they're going to spend £17 billion on content this year, one yeah. way or another, making stuff or buying it in or whatever it is. But the reason that they ha- that it seemed as though they were doing more stuff before was because this was the streaming wars, which, yeah. as we've discussed on the podcast before... Netflix won. But that's what they were going for. They were paying for scale and they were, you know, they were spending, in lots of people's views, crazy amounts of money, but it worked. And, you know, Ted Sarandos, the co-CEO, it worked for him. And I think people now say that they're going to account for half of the world's streaming in really quite soon that's it so they are the first global tv channel this has never been really tried before they're like a sort of universal adapter yeah. for things the chief content officer is this woman she's she is some kind of monster but i'm slightly fascinated by her she's called <laughs> bella bajaria and she sort of travels between all the territories she, she's one of these absolute sort of energizer bunny people who don't really seem to sleep and she coined this sort of really pretty dreadful phrase she once said it should be the gourmet cheeseburger a netflix show mm. which means that it's very commercial and it's kind of mainstream but it has sort of premium elements to it. Yep. But she now says that when people say to her, as they used to always say to the, the old network executives or, um, or you know, companies like HBO, you know, what makes a Netflix show? She feels they're making a category mistake because the whole point to her is you do not want to have a definitive type of show because you need to cater, first of all, you're in all these territories, you need to cater to every different kind of mood and time of the day and all of these type of things. So instead of having a really sort of definitive house style, they want all this stuff because in the streaming era, the measure of how well your platform is doing is how regularly do people come Onto, onto the platform, as in, if they, you know, you want them on there every day, ideally, and how long do they stay, how engaged are they? And it seems quite simple, but it's amazing how many people will say, oh, no, but this was very deeply watched. It's like, none of this matters, OK? What really matters is how often they come and how long they stay and how engaged they are. So she needs to have absolutely every type of programming. So the idea of a Netflix show is a category mistake that belongs in an era which Netflix has kind of blown out of the water with their, with their model. So this is my thesis about what's happened. So they had to get as many eyeballs as possible. And the way to do that is to try and get everyone to come and work for them and make their shows for them. So for a good five years, they were the creatives channel. They were the channel of producers and directors and writers and big actors. You know, that was the job they but were doing. Because, they, because you don't think HBO... Well, I always think of HBO as the ultimate, but that's because... But it's so much smaller, I suppose. Is yes. that what, but, exactly but equally, that. it's... They were trying to be HBO for the, for for the whole world. yeah. Uh, and so they're throwing enormous amounts of money at these creators, and so, you know, everyone in the industry adored them. Um, now, because, you know, there's venture capital involved, and, you know, they, as you say, they've won the streaming wars. Yeah. They've won that land grab, that battle for viewers. And now, um, you know... Uh, venture capital wants its money back it wants to start seeing profits which is what absolutely always happens and you know is absolutely what should happen and of course we've got interest rates for high around the world so again wall street needs its money back so i think it's turned from the creator's channel into the viewer's channel and that's a sounds like everything should be a viewer's channel but i think it's an interesting shift which is it threw so much money to try and get creatives to make things for it put lots of people on exclusive deals lots and lots of people at absurdly high rates Uh, and now it's a channel that says no we want ratings we want as many people to watch that and they are understanding that spending forty thousand pounds buying cleaning up with sheridan smith is that honestly how much you think they spent on that yeah god uh jane featherston may say it was sixty thousand, but certainly it wasn't 200 million Oh. And so they are viewer first now rather than creative first. And creatives don't really love that, no. is the truth, because they loved it when they could go to Netflix and just say, oh, can we do this, can we do it? I've got this passion project. And Netflix would go, oh, here's $40 million. Of course you can do that, which is now not happening. So going to Netflix now, and I'm working with Netflix at the moment and enjoying it very, very much, yeah. but going to Netflix now is like going to any other channel, yeah. which is they are not going to throw their money around. They are incredibly careful about what they're commissioning. So, you know, the Guy Ritchie stuff is very mainstream. The Harlan Coburn, which is a huge hit for them, very, very mainstream. 
Um, so if you're Netflix, of course you're making these great shows, big mainstream things, not as many of them as you used to, but you're also going to be relying on back cataloging. You're going to be relying on the likes of the BBC and Channel 4 and ITV, you know, to, to provide you with those shows. Uh, but that ecosystem has been damaged by Netflix and therefore there's going to be fewer and fewer of those shows anyway. To buy in, to, yeah. To buy to in. License, yeah. So you sort of wonder in five years' time, well, where are we? Because you're not going to be still making these huge premium shows. We will have run out of those shows on the those other channels because you priced everyone out of the market. Um, so where, where does that wheel turn next? I just think it's fascinating that interest rates and Wall Street have such a big impact on our culture in a way we don't really think about yeah. and how Netflix and by the way this is not having a go at Netflix in any way whatsoever it's that they're in the right business and I do genuinely think they're incredibly viewer facing uh, and they've come to the conclusion that to be viewer facing is no longer let's just get 20 premium bits of talent and give us give them as much money as possible it's let's just get some great big mainstream shows of stars that people recognize in them yeah and do 20 Standard 30 40 procedurals of comedies thrillers all the yeah. things that were the bread and butter of the, the channels they sort of replaced yeah. but you know it is a phenomenal company and in, in the true sense of that word because it is so strange to think that barely any time ago in the great scheme of things it was let me mail to you dvds yeah. in the post go to netflix.com make a list of the movies you want to see and in about one business day you'll get three dvds Keep them as long as you want, without late fees. To go and do what they've done is quite an extra. It is an extraordinary story, and yeah. it's a it is is a true phenomenon. And we've never really seen a global TV channel before, so it's almost all sort of virgin territory. Yeah, and it is still a fun place to work, and full of good people and interesting people. And you know, it's just it it used to be a complete open door. Well, that's what everybody thought that those times, the good, t the, yeah, this, yeah. Are the amazing <laughs> times of the seven fat cows coming Couldn't out of the end. Nile in television. Yeah, <laughs> that. But as we've said before, it's going to scripted content is going to come down by by about half. Yeah. Um. You say about the overall deals, the strikes provided a really good moment for people to say, "Yeah, no, we're not going to renew your overall deal. We've suspended your overall deal because you're on strike to writers and in some cases other types of creatives, and we will now not renew." And you might like they'll renew with Shonda Rhimes, who's kind yeah. of enormous, but uh, you, you know, other than that. They used it to get out of a, a, a large number of deals. But my goodness, you know, people, there's certain people who look back over the last five years and go, wow. I mean, <laughs> essentially, they were taking you money. You really never had it so yeah, good. They were taking money from venture capitalists. Yeah. You know, it was just going directly into their pockets and, you know, work for Netflix. But, uh, yeah, the next five years, I'm sort of rather looking forward to because I love big mainstream telly and I'm excited about, you know, what um, Netflix does with big mainstream telly. Um, but, uh, yeah, it'll be... There'll still be lots of prestige things, but I, there, there, there'll be fewer kind of people doing a $30 million development on a passion project yeah. that uh, we're never going to hear of. And is that a bad thing? <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to wait and see how that... It's how the rest of the market survives. Um, and that's really interesting. Yeah. Whether, you know, there'll obviously have to be acquisitions because people are just too small to compete with them. And it how the rest of it shakes down will also determine creatively how they have to compete and what they have to spend to get those eyeballs. And also for things like that they do genuinely care about, they do care about things like awards and prestige and things like that, which may not be particularly viewer facing, but they really mind about those things too. So it will be it will be interesting to see how, in terms of the acquisitions, how the market ends up shaking down. But it's also fascinating that billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars have been thrown at Netflix to say, the old model of how we make television is broken. We're in a whole new world now. And of course, five or six years down the line when they've got market dominance, they're like, oh, actually what we want, we're going to start scheduling live sports yeah. and, we, and we're going to buy you know dramas and put them out once a week. And we're building um, an ad tier, and and we're which an is our tier. biggest growing yeah. thing, the free ad, yeah. the, you know, the free ad supported television, which is like, oh, yeah, OK. Yeah. So they spent <laughs> billions and billions to say this industry isn't working and now they're turning into the thing yeah. that they're replacing. Listen, it's capitalism. <laughs> The Conservative Party, they've had a couple of online ads. They had a sort of really lo-fi ad about what's great about this country. 
Spitfires, The King, strangely Christopher Nolan looking into an IMAX camera yeah. and an Aston Martin. I mean, it really honestly did look like it had been done in sort of 10 minutes by someone who was not potentially human. Obviously, it went viral. They've, they'd done one that had gone viral about two weeks before, which was voiced by an American and was saying that, you know, London is a sort of hellhole. The metropolis teetering on the brink of chaos. And in the chaos... People seek a desperate reprieve. It even included some footage of people running away from what they thought was gunfire. That was actually in Penn Station in New York. Yeah. So they then took that little bit of footage out and re-released it. It's starting to have the feel of a deliberate strategy, isn't it, Rich? Well, I think they've been quite open that it's deliberate. And it's fascinating. So with this new one, I, I, I think it has jumped the shark. So they, in the 2019 election, they got an Australian PR company to come and do that their kind of yep. s social media strategy and they had just won the Australian election with Scott Morrison which was a surprising win mm. by the way so you'll remember there was a time they they did an advert which was um let's get brexit done yeah. and it was just in black type on white but in comic sans font the sort of famously dreadful excruciating comic front font yes the sort of thing yeah. that you you, yeah. you do at your school fair it's a shorthand for a shorthand yes. yes it's a short it's a shorthand for oh my god this person doesn't know how to do digital media yeah um and as they always do the left were sharing this left right and center just saying oh my god this is the most hilariously bad thing i've ever seen and of course that's exactly what they wanted to happen they weren't really sitting there going, oh, let's do, what's the, what font should we use? What's this one? Oh, well, this is a fun one, Comic Sans, let's do that. No. What they were doing is they were saying, if we do this in Comic Sans, this is going to be catnip to absolutely everyone. It's going to be shared, you know, it's far and wide. Everyone's going to have an opinion on it. Everyone's going to quote tweet it. So it's going, it's going to be everywhere. And they did a Comic Sans one. They did one in sort of they Mr. Blobby covers. They did about Blobby 10 in covers. one day one day. There was one exactly. absolutely mad day where they were just firing these things yeah. out. Because they knew one of them would be because the, let's the consider the alternative. The alternative is that you share a good political advert. Yeah. Please tell me if that has ever happened in, yeah. in the history of humanity. They want you to be angry on social media because they've proved that people, when you're angry, you stay longer on the platform. So this is something that kind of fits in with those rhythms and is deliberately designed to be hate shared only. It's even more than that because then it's hate shared by so many people that people start writing news stories about yeah. how, you know. So as we've talked about even on this episode before, once they're writing news stories, then you really are getting a whole sort of page of free advertising. But I'm depressed to live in the time where you have to just be really crap and, and, and terrible and then everyone will share it. I mean, does it, it just feels like everything's so wrong if that if people are deliberately trying to be bad. Well, here's here's the interesting thing. So, so the Brexit one back in 2019, Topham... Gerin, uh, the, the name of the PR company, um, as I said, they, they'd done the Australian thing. They, there was a very clear message in that election, which was, let's get Brexit done, right? And that was a very powerful message. You could, and they, could, they knew that message was really cutting through. Yeah. They knew that people liked them. The people they needed to vote for them, which is the 10% of people in the middle, they knew that was resonating with people. So their job is to get that message out. And putting that in Comic Sans and the various other ways actually did exactly that. Now, Twitter is meaningless. No one ever no. got a single vote on Twitter. Uh, where you win elections is Facebook. Yeah. Right? That's, the, uh, that's where elections yeah. are won and will be for the next you know, four or five elections. And that image was seen again and again and again and again and again and again on Facebook. Stripped of any of the irony, stripped of the comments, stripped of anyone caring about, you know, is it deliberately bad or not? Just the words, let's get Brexit done yeah. with the Conservative Party branding. Now, that to me is effective advertising that's using your opponent's weight against them that's knowing yeah. that somebody is going to think you you are more stupid than them they're going to point out that you're more stupid than them and you've won because they've done your job for you now this new one this week there is no message in there the message in it is with a second the biggest message is, is economy that Britain's get great don't talk it down i mean if your message going into the election is britain is great yes i, I think you've misunderstood the state of mind of, of people in this country yeah. at the moment because you're going to need something a little bit better than that they can look out the window and tell you it isn't so i think that's the interesting thing because people are cottoning onto that strategy and i think probably they've they've got less good at it if you had a single thing that was working for you a single strap line that was working for you about this country put that on the top of that advert that goes viral everywhere and people are seeing that but they didn't the strap line is the second biggest economy it's don't let the doom 
mobsters and naysayers tell you. But I mean, it's just, it's, there's nothing. And so that can be shared till kingdom come, and it's having no effect on anyone apart from the thing which you just said, which is it is depressing to see something that's so obviously designed yeah. to annoy people. If it's too obvious, it yeah. becomes a form of contempt for the voters. And yeah. I would say that that has now tipped uh, into I it. I agree 100%. You've got the king on there. It's illegal to have the king there. You've got a Eurofighter there. You've got um, a ship which is made in South Korea and owned by um, the Italians. You've got to the <laughs> England men's football team in a thing about Britain and a team that's oh, yeah. one less than the women. because, But they know that... That's going to upset people and annoy people. They got Christopher Nolan, who lives in LA. In the same week, they're cutting massive funding to universities for their creative arts. All of that stuff. This one is not effective because they don't have a message. The whole point of advertising is get your message across. Let's get Brexit done. That's the message that was resonating, and they got it across. In this one, they haven't. So all they're doing is cheapening our culture. All they're doing is showing they don't have a message. And I do think that that's depressing. I think that you just think, if you're going to do bad adverts, do them well. Yeah. You know? Like the old, like the old cinema adverts for your local curry house, which I love, anything like yeah. that. Just do something super lo-fi. But, it, you know, almost all advert, you know, that's the thing we've learned with click-through culture, is just tell people what the thing is. Yeah. And if they like it, they'll click on it. Mm. And, you know, the, listen, there'll be people out there listening to this who were involved in it and you know what the vibe is you know what the deal is they know they weren't you know they were kind of going this is, this is going to own yeah. the libs but you know that you know that it's not great yeah oh no they know and they yeah. know that but i guess they've been contracted and they will produce a number of adverts yeah. this year and then they'll just get out with their money and i they will not be on the winning side according to literally there's a 99 percent chance currently yeah see the london one not- sort of has some effectiveness i mean it was awful and it was, again, embarrassing, but at least it kind of played into a message that, you know, seems to work for them a little bit, which is scaring people in London, that London's a scary place to be. Yeah. And you think, well, the trouble is that most people you're trying to, you know, get to there actually live in London and they know and it's they, not. No, it isn't. But actually, yeah. it's a very, it's a very, it is quite an effective message to the rest that of London's the country. terrible yeah. to the rest of the country. And a lot of people sort of believe it. But, but uh, as it's, someone broadcasting from London, now I can say that. We seem fine. <laughs> it's, 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 it's mostly fine. It seems okay. I mean, we, listen, we're besieged by drug dealers outside the studio, but, uh, you know, it's fine. We've got, a, we've got an armoured car to take us home. Yes. As always. They're doing it deliberately. Uh, they've been doing it deliberately for a few years now. They seem to have got an awful lot less good at it, but I think that might be because they've got they've absolutely run out they've of things to no say. They've got yeah. So if you are behind it, just say, look, come on. If you've got nothing to say... Let's at least do something positive and stop get trying to... Get Nolan to do your next advert. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Just giving him a knighthood. I Get Nolan to do an advert for you. I feel it seems unlikely that he will pay the commission. Yeah, I would have thought so. But listen, it's worth a go. Yeah, I mean, he's good at filming disasters. Get Guy Ritchie to do it. <laughs> he is a celebrity conservative, actually, so he probably he? would. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no shared. You can presumably surmise it from the output. Okay, well, listen, it's, um, I'm less culturally oh no he oh. always no he always was always he, right back in the sort of days of william Hague, even oh really i think they would they used to fight each other in uh, at a judo club in in, in chelsea funnily enough the budaquai center it was called and i they yeah they were they were mat mates really Rich, yeah. richie, and, richie Hague. and Hague, yeah well richie and Hague really. is a good cop duo yeah <laughs> would netflix make it yeah well listen if the stick um sit ross kemp in it <laughs> he would be a great Hague. vinnie jones as guy richie if I was this, I'm not kidding now. If I ran Apple, I'd be like, I'm interested. So uh, let's talk. What has happened at Disney is that the chief executive is a guy called Bob Iger, who has recently been facing a proxy battle by an activist investor for, for seats on the board, basically. This guy called Nelson Peltz, who is an activist investor, but I hope listeners to this podcast know him chiefly as Brooklyn Beckham's father in law. Yeah. Activist investor, I always think, sounds like someone with a placard outside a like a, like a big corporation complaining about mining conditions. But uh, I, I don't think that's Nelson Peltz. Yeah, they call them activist investors. Essentially, they think a company is not bringing enough value to the shareholders, and so they go in. That's the kind of activism that yeah, they're yeah. interested in is returning more. It does. It sounds a sort of romantic thing, like you know, someone who's just scraped together a few pennies, managed to get some shares, and is going to stand up at the board meeting and demand better uh, conditions to the workers. But in fact, obviously, he lives in some sort of sprawling 
hideous estate, you know, one of those old American estates that dates back all the way to 1987 in, in Palm <laughs> Beach in Florida, and where Nicola and Brooklyn Beckham were, of course, married. And the irony is, of course, he's actually made a fortune from his shares because Disney shares keep going up and yes. up. So that thing of go woke, go broke has literally disproved it himself by Disney going woke and him making a fortune out of it. Yes, I mean, I'm, he's a man of contradictions, so I imagine he's quite easy with that He's one. a man of contradictions and he's, <laughs> uh, he's, he's at the Beckham's Christmas table. Last week, he was unsuccessful in his bid to try and get some seats on the board. But the fact that this happened at all to Bob Iger is not great. Disney is the sort of biggest company, but I do feel that sort of Bob Iger has been for a long time been able to look in his magic mirror and say, who's the most powerful of them all? And it would show back a picture of Bob Iger to go along the Disney analogy. But <laughs> recently... Yeah, I got, oh, I got it. Recently... I'll, I'll let you go. Oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think Richard's understood. I'm, I this, is, this is a reference to who's it. Yeah. <laughs> I go, no, I, I got it. Do a but, Toy Story but, one now. But re recently, <laughs> I think staring back at him from that, the, ma the magic mirror has been saying, is Ted Sarandos, the Netflix yeah. co-CEO, is he perhaps the first one? And I think there's a strong argument for, obviously, he has absolutely leapfrogged in any sort of power list, Ted Sarandos. Um, but... It's amazing, this proxy battle. I sh should say, I mean, tens of millions have been spent yeah. just trying to persuade the individual shareholders, which, by the way, are some institutional, but a third are kind of retail, ordinary shareholders who are sort of dreamers and love the Disney brand. And then yeah. like, members of the public say it's quite unusual in that way. Now, tens of millions, honestly, more has been spent on this particular battle than all the political parties in the UK will spend on the whole of the general election that, whenever it happens. I would have got the people behind the advert with the with the container ship <laughs> yeah. and the England football team to do it. Thank God they didn't anyway. But because Nelson Peltz really has absolutely no ideas of what to do with Disney at all, he's a, just a sort of troublemaker. But he may well come back. It's humiliating that it's happened for Ted Sarandos. But anyway, they've won. Now, what that now immediately kicks off is the succession battle because Iger has said. I'm going to leave in 2026. By the way, Bob Iger's tried to leave this company quite a few mm. times before and not tried that hard. He it's hard to, it's 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 hard to quit. Hard to quit. Well, you yeah. know, this is a company that's got such an abiding sense of itself. It's placed in the American and the global imagination. Yeah. It's not you know, remember that even at, at Disney World, even the servers in the restaurant, the, the, the cleaners are all known as cast members. Wow. You know, this is a company that is very sort of unique in lots of different ways, which is why that third of the shareholders are a sort of interesting body of people. Anyhow, the succession, you know, it's not called, it's really putting the kingdom in the magic kingdom. They have said that he's going in 2026. He has said, but as we say, he said it a, lot, a few times he's going before. And it's going to be one of four internal candidates. <gasps> oh, I like this really, already. It's interesting. Yeah, there are, I'll tell you who they are. There are Alan Bergman, who is the co-chair of Disney Entertainment. He deals with the films. So he's on top of Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, the Disney animation and live studio, what we might think of more as the sort of heritage Disney yeah. movies. Okay? So is he, is he Kendall Roy? Yeah, they, they don't really fit into the Roy family okay. template. However, but it is interesting. Now, his co chair of Disney Entertainment is a woman called Dana Walden. She's had lots of hits. She's had The Bear, The Dropout, Abbott Elementary, uh, yeah. Bluey, um, oh, wow. Only Murders in the Building, which is huge. The other guy, there's two other guys. One's from ESPN, a guy called Jimmy Pitaro, and then there's Josh Damaro, who runs Parks and Cruises. Okay. Now, Played by Matthew McFadden. Yeah, and, be, yeah, and people think it's a nothing. But you know what? Parks and Cruises is by far the most successful part of Disney at the moment. It's massive. It's, re it's outperforming everything else. Um, they make more, twice as much from Parks and Cruises as they do from entertainment, which tells you quite a lot of things yeah. about how, what the state of entertainment is. They're all internal. They will all try and lobby, you know, work against each other, but be very, very nice in public. None of them is the full package. Now, you go back to Michael Eisner, who is a monster. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're massive entertainment executives. They're all monsters. Um, Monsters Inc. He, he, Monsters Inc. Eisner is a fascinating person because he was impossibly difficult in lots of ways, but he was all <laughs> over the kind of geopolitical expansion of Disney and all those types of deal. But he would also have an incredible amount of notes on like verse two of one song in Aladdin. Yeah. So it's, I suppose, the notional idea of anyone's view of a great Disney executive is someone who's sort of really good with the talent and the creative, but also this kind of runner, almost like a sort of head of state in another way mm. and can do all these deals. It's brilliant with the investors. And that's what in anyone's mind's eye that we'll, we'll always have. You in have my, to step up and become that. In my mind's eye, it would be um, a cartoon. A cartoon. <laughs> 
and yeah. Disney would be run by a like a like a friendly cat. That you know? would, which would be I mean they slightly always want to tell you that it's run by a mouse, but yeah, <laughs> but, but, it's but with not. like an unusual hat, like maybe a golf club, and yeah. just every now and again just go four. <laughs> But that that could happen with AI, right? You could have a you could have an animated Disney. Anyway, listen, I dig- an animated I, chief executive. Yes, it may well be the future because it's just. I digress. I think we should throw our hat into the ring at Disney as the next heads of Disney, but at, with 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 an avatar representing us. <laughs> we just get the technology sorted. We make the decisions. Get a few other get Jesse Armstrong, someone like that. Someone who he understands big business, doesn't he? he wrote Succession. Yeah. Uh, but we have yeah a cartoon cat. A driverless company with a cartoon cat in charge. Hello. Hello. I mean, sorry. What's, Stop what's, giving your ideas away for free, Richard. What's, I... that, what's that I'm smelling? Profit. <laughs> uh, no, but we should do it. So that, that's going to play out uh, over the next over 18 the next, months or so. Yeah. But I think they're about to have a very good year in movies because you've got the Deadpool, Wolverine. Q1 in Hollywood, it's badly down. And it, I mean, a big year in movies is not what a big year in movies was seven years ago. Exactly, but that's great news for Bergman. That's where, that's where <laughs> Well, yeah, he could really is. use it here, as I say, because they have not... All of those franchises are massively underperforming yeah. at the moment. But Deadpool, I think, will do well because people still love Deadpool. Moana that will be 2, one of the biggest Moana movies 2, of the year. Moana 2, I think, is going to be huge. Yeah, but Moana 2 is interesting. Moana 2 is a kind of bit of chum that Iger threw out on the earnings call to sort of say, here's all these exciting things are coming. We're doing a big investment in gaming, with yeah, epic games. And as we discussed at the time, Moana 2, like Moana is like one of the most downloaded things ever. When it was on, I think it is the most downloaded thing, when it was on Netflix, when before they had Disney Plus and they licensed their stuff to Netflix, it was, I, that thing just poured out money all day long. But actually Moana was supposed to be an animated TV series. They're repurposing that as a movie. Now that, it's a piece of, sort of, as I say, a piece of chum he threw out in that earnings court. It went down very well, and, yeah. you know, particularly with those that third of investors. But you it's just a rebadge. Well, it is a bit, isn't it? I'll be interesting to see it, because to me, a long TV series then remade into a movie is, is quite an odd pivot. What is absolutely crucial for Disney more than anything else is to make streaming work. They have, mm. in North America, in, in America, they have fewer than half of what Netflix has in terms of subscribers. And around the world, it's, you know, they're obviously doing worse than Netflix. They have to find a way to make their streaming work and, you know, with their sports bundling, all sorts of things, but they have to find a way to make it work because if they don't, then they haven't found a way to be a Disney corporation in in the age of streaming and in a, in a, in a modern media company. I look forward to hearing those names uh, more. As yeah, this, we'll, be uh, follow, we'll follow it because it's sort of yeah. quite fun and obviously they retain a very special place in the kind of creative imagination as a company. And as an interesting addendum, um, a lot of the Nelson Peltz, which, by the way, is a fun name to say, Nelson Peltz, uh, a lot of his agenda, activist investor, was that he felt Disney was becoming too woke. He was really angry that he'd had to see an all-black Marvel film. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you made quite a lot of money. Yeah, so I, I think he was right angry Nelson. they'd made more than a billion on, on a movie. Yeah. It, so, you know, it's, it's interesting that it was defeated. I'm really roundly and soundly defeated but I as well. Yeah, but, I, but equally, he hasn't totally gone away. And, of course, if there's a Trump presidency at the end of the year, then things get harder for Disney Oh, yeah, as these well, guys, uh, him and this other guy, Ike Perlmutter, who is a genuine monster and used to run Marvel and was sort of ousted and therefore was very bitter about it all, they are real regulars at the Mar-a-Lago buffet with, yeah. uh, with Donald Trump. If there is a Trump presidency, then, again, I think that... It, that the Disney Corporation has been in a bit of trouble in Florida. They've had it from both sides. They mishandled internally with their own workforce this uh, the don't say gay law that came in in Florida about people's right to have their children not taught about the existence of homosexuality in schools. And then they've sort of been a bit at war with Ron DeSantis. I think he actually, like many people, he, he's one of the many people who've had a rite of passage. I think he got married at the Grand Floridian Hotel in Disney World, Florida. Really? It's a big, it's, it's hard to imagine because we just don't have it in this country. But, you know, getting married at Disney World, I guess, being christened in a swimming pool at Disney yeah. World. This is, it's a bigger thing than you think. It's got, quite I, hard to, we have no cultural equivalents. I got married at Legoland. <laughs> no, I didn't, but if I thought of it. Yeah, if you had thought yeah. of it, it would have been perfect. Um, so, perfect. so, yeah, lots of genuine monsters. And the best person to take on a genuine monster, Cartoon Cat. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, well, 
<laughs> oh, you fin- you finally lost patience with me, Marina. It was, al- it was always going to happen. The idea of, I love the idea of driverless Disney. I, re- I really like it. If anyone at home or any listener can design us um, a cat you think would be make a really, really appealing CEO of Disney, then let's just let's, let's start working just on it. some off-brand cat that doesn't infringe on any of their um, original exactly. copyright. But, yeah. th- but they could then own. Yeah. So they could then own their CEO as a franchise that could run for years and years and years. You're trying to sell animation to Disney. Disney. I really no, admire Hutzpah. In the same way that Netflix is trying to sell um, scheduled television to, uh, to, to, be, to Britain, yeah. To I'm, a country I'm where saying, it killed it. Yeah. How about, how about a cartoon Disney? What do we think about what do we think about that? A lot of people like them. A couple of recommendations this week. Um, the Apprentice, which someone said to me the other day, do people still watch The Apprentice? The answer being yes, it's absolutely massive and this series has been a good one but this week it's the single greatest episode in any uh, reality show franchise which is the interviews uh, bit of it which even if you've not watched the rest of The Apprentice you just dive in and see Claude Littner look at someone's business plan and it's always brilliant just watch someone else's anxiety dream yeah exactly that and um also, Night Coppers on Channel 4, I'm absolutely loving. It sort of follows the night shift down in Brighton, and it's a sort of mix of them stopping fights, but also, you know, lots of mental health issues and, and concentrates on the on the personalities made by Blast Films. And it's brilliant. Channel 4, very good at crime things, I think. I think 24 Hours in Police Custody and Night Coppers are, are brilliant, but that's, that's just started, uh, and it's uh, terrific. So The Apprentice and Night Coppers. And with that, we're going to see you on Thursday for our... Questions edition. Questions and answers edition. And answers. Yeah. Do keep sending them in. The email address is the rest is entertainment at gmail.com. Uh, thanks, Marina. Thank you very much. I'll see you on Thursday. See you Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Thursday.